Winter Dance by Gary Paulson. The fine madness of running the Iditarod. Prelude. The storm broke with a sudden viciousness that startled, frightened me. I left camp with eight dogs and a lightly loaded sled just after midnight. They were my problem, dogs. In all teams, there are the good dogs, some not-so-good dogs, and then there are the problem dogs. Dogs that might be a bit too young, or like to fight too much, or spend too much time looking back to see what the sled driver is doing. They require extra effort. The problem dogs, more time to understand, time to know, time to learn how they think and act and work. So, once every four days or so, I would harness the problem dogs and head up a mountain and try to learn from them and about them. We were in Alaska to train three months before my second I did rod race, and I was learning as much as the dogs. The difficulty came because of a headache. Simple things, small things, change lives. My winter cap had fallen in the fire and burned. I bought a new one, but it had more bulk, a thicker weave. When I left camp, I put my battery pack on my waist and the band for the headlamp around my head and over the cap so the light was centered on my forehead. It was too tight because the hat was more bulky. The band was adjusted as far out as it would go, and to fix it I would have to sew on a piece of cloth to extend it. But the dogs were already harnessed and hooked in the gang line, and screaming to run in the high-pitched shrilling keenness of that demanded- that high-pitched shrilling keenness keening shrillness that demanded hurrying. So, without changing the headband, I stood to the sled and unhooked it from the birch tree that held it. They ran well at first, excited by the run. I left camp and headed north and east up the mountains that marked the end of the Alaska range. As the trail steepened and the snow grew more powdery with altitude, the dogs slowed and settled in for the long haul over the pass. An hour passed, waffling along in the dog's breath, the runners sang. Everything, everything with the dogs, with the country, with my life, with each breath. Everything was beautiful, but I didn't, couldn't see it. I was in agony. My head was throbbing from the tight band on the headlamp, and I wasn't seeing beauty, dogs, sled, country, any of it. The Chinese have a proverb that says, a man with a toothache cannot be in love and that concept was very much driving me. My temples ached and the pain worked around my head, ra warping my thoughts, warping my thinking to keep me on not only from enjoying the run, but from watching warning signs, paying attention to the dogs. And when I finally started to see things, it was too late by far. They tried, the dogs, the trees, the wind, when I stopped to check dog feet and work in ointment, a big, white, slab-sided dog named Crackers started fidgeting, smelling the breeze that was now and then gusting into the wind. I didn't understand it. I didn't see it for the warning it was. Flakes of snow, not large and fluffy, but small and mean, driven, started to appear. They were a sign of weather coming, as was Crackers' rec restlessness. He hated storms and liked to be well holed up before they hit. But I ignored the snow as it fell, finished working on their feet, and called the dogs up as soon as I'd finished. I'd had in mind finishing the run, making some kind of loop, 80 or 90 miles, and getting done with it and back to camp in comfort where I could sew a new band for the headlamp, or the goddamn headlamp as I was beginning to think of it, and I had in my misdirected focusing and my strict focusing on my own small problems completely forgotten some of the basic tenets of running dogs. The most important, your home is where you are with the team, the sled, you cannot outrun weather. Or as I had heard one musher say, you've got to dance even when the music sucks. The music was souring, the wind was increasing exponentially. It had lacked purpose for a time, wallowed this way and that, but now it was dr it had direction and some force, and the sleet had increased as well, not completely obsc obscuring vision yet. I could still see the team pretty well in the yellow-white spot of the headlamp, but definitely more 
than it had been another warning. And I still, still ignored it, and worse, far worse, by ignoring it, I did things to compound the error. I went through a tight stand of dense spruce. They were thickly, set thickly and blocked the wind completely, and some of them were dead and would have made a wonderful firewood. I could have stopped here and ripped, tipped the sled and pulled the tarp over the top to make a nearly perfect shelter, and could have made a fire at the mouth with wood enough to last a week all within easy reach. Could, out, could have laid out a foam pad, pulled a few things inside with me, and ridden out the storm in complete comfort. I had four cans of beef stew and 45 pounds of meat for the dogs, and we could have lived well with even, even with storm rat rationing. Could have. Instead, my head was getting pinched, and I passed through the trees without noticing them, or at least without thinking of what they could mean to me and the dogs' shelter, warmth, and hope. Life. At the end of the stand of spruce, the trail left Timberline and headed into the snowfields of the high country. In truth, there wasn't much of a trail, more just a line, or more th than, or more often, no mark at all in the snow, and I was depending on the lead dog, a tiny female named Dewberry, to find the way. She was good at it, sometimes going by feel as she trotted quick and alert her little back and white form tugging out like a beacon. Just as the trail left the trees, it moved into a shallow depression that went along the side of the mountain for two miles or so, angled so that I had to stand on one runner and pull the sled over at an angle to keep it from sliding down the mountain. This put my parka back to the wind, and that, coupled with being in the depression and having a headache, made me not notice further warnings the wind was much stronger now, going straight in line with no eddies, getting force from somewhere, going to somewhere, reaching the point where small things would start to become very, very important. Little ignorances, small sillinesses, a loose belt, a dropped mitten, could cripple, could kill. At the end of the depression, the trail moved out into the partial open, still slight around the side of the mountain, but where there could be no shelter, and anybody except a complete idiot would know the serious of the wind, seriousness of the wind and the storm. But I hungered with my back to it all, my head thunking away, staring down at the runner next to me, while I stood on the other sideways and wished to hell that I had taken the time to make my head bend longer for another mile, then another, then another, seven, eight miles out into the snowfields above Timberline, away from shelter, away from heat, and away from comfort, and away from wet rest, and into madness. I had turned three quarters away from the wind, not just back to it, but looking to the rear, down the trail, half bemused that our tracks were blowing and filling before the sled had gone eight, eight feet, which was about as far as I could see in the blowing snow and wind. Here, some survival code kicked in, some nudge in my thoughts that if the tracks were filling that fast, the wind must be getting worse. Right then, Dewberry took the team around the side of the mountain, and it was like passing around the end of a wall. Dewberry simply vanished. I had swung around and looked forward as we came out into the true open just in time to see a churning cloud of white hit her from the side like a bulldozer. For an instant I thought she was merely obscured by snow and squinted trying to see through the roiling mass and then the sh suddenly shrieking wind, but it was impossible. She was gone, blown away to the side, and in a heartbeat the sled and the rest of the team were carried by momentum into the roar and were gone as well. I grabbed, snatched with my hand as the wind hit it, but hit, but at, hit, but it was too sudden, too wild, and I was torn from the sled, taken by the wind, tumbling end over end down the mountain. Velocities, technical terms, are meaningless. I knew a man who tried to make a winter ascent of Mount Denal, or McKinley, who was blown off the mountain, Mount Denali. Lost and dead and gone, and the body never found, and some estimated that the wind had to be 150, 200 miles an hour to carry a human body sideways off a mountain. 
I do not know how fast the wind was blowing. I never have, including two typhoons in the Philippines. And I have never, including two typhoons in the Philippines, been in anything remotely like the force that took me now. I had literally no control over my life. It simply blew me sideways from the sled. I tried to hook my elbow in the, in the handlebar, but I missed, and I had another glimpse of the, sw of the sled slinging, swinging like a weather vane, hanging downward from the team, hanging downwind from the team, and then nothing. I tried to stand, but the wind kept knocking me down, tumbling at me end over end in, down the mountain. I would try to grab hold, but there was nothing to catch, and I just kept rolling and bouncing. I'm not sure how long it lasted. I was completely disoriented, had only the vaguest idea of up and down, and could see nothing, hear nothing but the scream of the wind. It could have blown me anywhere it wanted, blown me to hell, blown me off the world, and I wouldn't have known it. Instead, it fetched me up against a rocky outcropping covered with ice. I hit with a thump that knocked the air out of my lungs, burying my head in a mound of snow. I hung there for seconds, perhaps half, perhaps half a minute, held by the pressure of the wind pushing me against the ice and rock and thinking started to come back in jerks. The dogs. The dogs. Where were the dogs? Were they alright? Dewberry! I tried to call yell her name, but the wind tore it away was still on my side, half raised, and I used my mittened hands like claws to hold the rocks while I edged around to the side, searching for a place that was out of the blast, inches at a time, once my foot seemed to hang out over space, and the wind lifted my leg, floated it up, and I jerked it back down, slithered a bit and came around beneath a slight overhang, and for the first time caught my breath, and felt as if I might be able to hold the position. It was, I thought, the way people died, what I was doing, little things, small things, kill. I was partially out of the wind, but I had no gear apart from my clothing, no food, no fuel, no nothing. It happened just this way, caught in the wind, cold, blowing snow, confused enough to forget life and death came. Caught in the wind, cold, blowing snow, confused enough to forget life, and death came. Winds in the high country sometimes lasted days, weeks, and I was locked in, caught in the back of a small rock face, lost. There were moments of self-pity and anger at how stupid I had become. To compound my problem, my batteries were going down fast, and my headlamp was very dim. I had fresh batteries in a bag on the sled, but... Then instinct took over and I tried to make the best of what with, of what I had. In the slight yellow glow and eddying snow, dumped by the wind as it came over the rock, I saw that the opening went back in slightly, a foot and a half beneath the overhang. The hole was filled with hard-packed snow and I started digging, making almost no impression in the frozen snow when I felt a presence. This had happened before, when hallucinating it was all in my mind, in truth, I was tired and not thinking straight, and I looked over, I looked around once, and then decided that it was just that, my dreams catching up with me again, but I ignored it. But the feeling persisted, something was there, something was close, something or someone, and I couldn't ignore it. I stopped digging and turned, tried to see in the wall of snow and wind, but couldn't, f and snow and wind, but couldn't and yet felt if I just stretched, just moved away from the shelter a tiny bit, a tiny distance. Insane. To leave the shelter. If anything, the wind was worse, and if I moved out into the open, it would take me again, sweep me away. Yet I couldn't resist the pull. It was there, something, something close. I knew it absolutely, and I scrabbled around on my stomach, pulled away from the shelter a few inches, a foot, hung on the edge of the wind with my left hand and my my left hand and the toe of my left boot dug into holes in the snow to hold me teetered there and was about to give up when i saw it a shape a triangular shape in the snow sitting there wobbling and weaving in the wind the sled 
Sitting upright, taking the full force of the storm and not moving, the sled was right in front of me, not four feet away. It simply couldn't be there. Should have been blown for miles, but it sat there, as if waiting for me to ride. For a second, I couldn't believe it. Laws of physics were being challenged. A goddamn tank would have, wouldn't have been able to sit there in that wind. Yet, there it was. And I crawled on my stomach until I could touch the end of the runner to convince myself it was real. And when I was close, I saw what had happened. Luck. All luck. As the sled tumbled, the snow hook, the sharp anchor tied to the gangline to hold the dogs when the sled is stopped, had bounced out of the leather carrying pouch and dragged along the snow. It was the kind of hook that is self-burying, like an anchor on a boat, biting deeper the harder it is pulled. But it had not set in the snow. Instead, it had skittered along in some way until it came to the rocks and then caught in a small crack that captured both sides of the hook. The team was there as well. I couldn't see them, but they were still tied to the sled, strung down the mountain with the wind pulling at them. I had been given life when there was almost no hope. But to live, to make it work, I would have to leave the shelter and work down the team and bring them back up to the rock, and all the while I would be dependent on the hook holding. If it popped loose, it would start all over. The wind would own us, and we would be gone once more, and there would- and there couldn't be the kind of luck again that would catch the hook just where it needed to catch. I lay looking at the rope and at the hook, trying not to think of the risk, the gamble, but thinking of other things that were important that I knew, and I knew that it wasn't me, it wasn't just me anymore, it was us. I could take the pad and the sleeping bag and food out of the sled and drag them back to the hole and make a shelter and live through it. I would be all right. I would even perhaps be comfortable. I. But the dogs were out in it, out in the wind, and with their backs to it, the wind would blow the hair, their hairs open, drive snow and sleet into the hair and closer to their bodies, and their body temperatures would go down. I had been told by other dog tr drivers, if their body temperatures went down, they could start building fluid in their lungs, get pneumonia, it could kill them. They might get me home, but they might die even then. And there came a moment, lying on my stomach, looking at the hook that, was ho that I was holding in place with my hands in the faint glow of my dying headlamp. Came a moment when I knew I couldn't allow that. In some way, we had gone past where, there, where that could be allowed gone past where I could have lived with myself, got, gone into an area where it had become we instead of I. For another moment my body rebelled, everything in, in me fought against giving up, depending on that hook caught in the crack, and working my way down the team to pull them back in with me. It was not a sensible act. But it happened. My legs moved, pushed me half, pushed me half up, still almost against my will. I hammered at the hook with both hands, trying to set the point deeper in the crack, grabbed the sled, and moved out into the wind. It had, if anything, increased in ferocity. It worked inside my parka hood, seemed to pluck at my eyelids and drive snow under them, and tore me loose. And it tore me loose once more, drove me down along the gangline, clutching, clutching at the main rope, as I moved through the dogs, who were in an unholy mess. They had tumbled in the wind themselves, blown ahead of the wind, and had tangled and re-tangled until some of them were upside down with all four feet caught in their tugs. I worked dog to dog, going by feel. My light was gone now, not even a glow, but I unharnessed and harnessed, even though... Even, and unharnessed and, and harnessed enough to know how the ropes and tugs and necklines should feel to the touch. As I untangled each dog, it stood, its back to the wind, and waited, and at last I came to Dewberry. She was the only one not tangled. She was curled in a small ball in the snow, and was reluctant to get up, but I pulled at her collar and she started up the slope, dragging her with me, clutching, clawing, heaving, until at last I was back in the small shelter of the overhang with her. Dewberry's tug was hooked on 
hooked back to the gag line, and she had been pulling the other dogs back and around and up with her. I put her to the side and kept pulling, putting each dog down next to her as they came with me until we were all there, crammed in the small space. They were demoralized by the wind, and two started to fight which triggered more fighting, and I cursed and screamed and coughed until they were relatively quiet once again. Then I grabbed the man main gang line and pulled the nose of the sled back and around to me, all still in the dark, and tipped it onto its side so the body of the sled would block some of the wind coming around the edge of the rock. We now had the start of a shelter. The rock making the biggest wall, the sled stopping the eddies on the upwind corner, and the dogs forming the rest on the downwind side. I unzipped the sled bag and took out my sleeping bag and foam pads, pulling them under me. Then, tucked myself into the sleeping bag and pulled dogs around in and on top of me until I was covered in a living mass of fur. Of course, they would not all fit, but I jammed the ones I could in on top of me and huddled in. They were at least out of the wind and comfortable on the sleeping bag and foam pad, and we settled in to ride out the storm. All of this took less than a half an hour, just reacting to the weather and the wind, I had not actually tried to think things through. In the shelter with the dogs on top of me, I started to think, and I realized that if the storm lasted for a long time, nobody would come looking for me for two or three days, if then, and that if there was a solution to my problem, if indeed I had a problem, it would have to come from me, from the dogs in me. I was alone. Always in my life there had been something else, someone else. There had been bad times, rough times, but there had somehow always been other people. But not now. It was, at the very first, frightening, and then a secondary feeling came. A kind of liberation that I did not understand. It made no sense. I was in a snow shelter in the Alaska range in the middle of the worst storm I had ever seen, with no po possible chance of external help, and I felt liberated. The dogs rested for a time, but they were not tired, and being jammed in on one another when it was not time to rest or stop made them uneasy. They have definite likes and dislikes, and will often hate each other, especially females, for no apparent good reason. Jamming them in, one on another, Tangling them is sometimes dangerous when they aren't tired. They started to fidget and fight, and within moments my clothes were torn and I was bleeding where I had been bitten. I bellowed at them and swore, and they settled again, with uneasy growls at each other, and I returned to my thoughts. I decided the reason I felt liberated was that there was there is a kind of freedom in being alone. It was true I could die and the dogs could die, but we had food for three days and maybe I could run for another four or five with no food. But if the storm dropped several feet of snow and it was soft, I would have to move in front of the dogs on snowshoes to make a trail, and it would be too, too much work for too long. Eighty to a hundred miles, at best a mile an hour, maybe half a mile an hour breaking trail. Math, while covered with dogs in a sh snow shelter, waiting out a storm. If you broke trail with snowshoes at half a mile an hour and it was 80 miles to camp, where there was food for the dogs, it would take 160 hours. Scott of Antarctica, who was a fool and didn't believe in dogs, died 11 miles from his food. The dogs moved and scrabbled again. I growled at them. I was starting to growl more and more at them and talk less, speaking in grunts. So, if it took 160 hours in normal weather, what would it take if you were truly alone and free of an and free, and another storm came up while you were trying to get back? What would it take if two trains left Chicago when there were storms and their lead dogs developed bad feet and they simply could not move and there was no food? It was still too soon in my dog career for me to begin to go mad while running them. That would come later. But the initial phases of madness, the focus, the primitive sharpness, the instincts were there. And when time became long, 
beneath the dogs hour after hour and the storm had not stopped, my thinking began to roll by itself, tumbling and falling until the heat from the dogs and my bag caught up, up with the strain and tiredness and I slept. I'm not sure how long I slept. Initially it was light and the dogs kept hassling, but soon I went to deep into deep REM sleep and was aware of nothing until I felt pain in my eyes. It was sharp, defined like needles, and I was awakened to a thin shaft of flashbulb bright white light drilling directly into my eyes through a hole between Dewberry, who was on my head, and a dog named Walter, who was across my chest and lower chin. I moved my head and shoulders, and the dogs felt me and yawned and stretched on top of me and then shook and shook, stood and shook. I saw the world through a shower of snow that had drifted and heaped on top of the dogs. It had not snowed much, but it had blown in very deep drifts here and there, and I sat up and saw the outcropping where we were sheltered was between two drifts, ten or so feet high. I unzipped the bag and stood and saw for the first time in daylight where I was. It was dazzling before a What's happening? Stop. My computer fan likes to make noise now. It was dazzling before, above, and out into the northwest lay the whole Alaska range. It's possible to live a month below McKinley in the range and never see them through the clouds, but there wasn't a cloud in the sky and the peaks looked like they were right on top of me. It was still, not a breath of wind, and deeply, intensely cold. 45, perhaps 50 below. I shook snow out of the bag and zipped it and rolled it. Then I flipped the sled up and knocked snow off the cloth sled bat bag. <clears throat> I would take time to cook food and feed the dogs. I pulled out the food bag in the stove and soon had the five gallon aluminum cooker melting snow and heating meat chunks for the dogs. I fed them and lined them out in the snow and untangled them and rehooked those that had been unhooked unloaded the sled, and then saw just exactly how close I had been. Two things, both possibly fatal. The hook, which I had depended, depended on when I made my way down to the dogs to drag them back into shelter. The hook had popped and hung by only one tiny corner of rock caught on the very tip of the left hook prong. It wobbled there, barely caught, and as I reached down for it, the movement of my hand brushing, brushing it loosened it the rest of the way and the hook fell away. It had been that close when I went to get the dogs. That fragile of thread held me. And when I stood to the sled and called the team up, started working back the way that we had come, squinting because I hadn't brought sunglasses, I saw what would have happened to us had the hook come loose. Below us where the wind would have driven us, lay a huge canyon. The wind had been blowing us toward the canyon wall, which dropped several hundred feet nearly vertically into a frozen river. I would not, could not have survived the fall without serious damage, and any damage would have been fatal. Lying in the bottom of the canyon broken, the dogs gone as well, none of us would have made it. The hook had caught blown the team down until they hung on the gang line still attached to the hook the hook had caught with dewberry not 50 feet from the edge of the canyon wall taking into account the drift that hung out over the edge now she was almost on top when the hook stopped her all luck everything had gone wrong not fixing the headband on the lamp not replacing batteries not stopping where i should have stopped moving into unknown territory in bad weather, all stupid mistakes, mistakes that have injured and killed people, and luck had kicked in, saved us. The snow wasn't in order in... Unordinarily, but not. Anyway, deep except the drifts, and we could move around those. Inordinately. There we go. 
could move around those until they settled and immersed until they settled and immersed myself in the run and the beauty of the mountains. We were high enough to see almost all the country back down to Willow and Anchorage spread out like an impossibly beautiful map below us. The dogs were running well, shoulders driving, all the tugs tight and and the absence of wind made the night b before seem like a bad dream. It did not hit me until later, much later. We finished the run and the dogs were tied back in camp, sleeping on straw, and I was sitting with my friend sipping tea, looking at the fire, cooking a 55-gallon barrel full of dog meat and mush. The heat from the fire made my face seem to burn, and I raised the cup of tea and my hands were shaking. Cold? My friend asked. I put the cup down but kept staring into the fire. No. Scared. Scared of what? I told him some of what happened, but not how close it had been, not how the hook looked hanging by one prong, not how the canyon yawned away forever down and down, and how the wind blew and how really, really goddamn close it had been. All of it rushed in now, and when I looked at the tea, thinking I would take a drink in a minute, when the shaken, I looked at the tea, thinking I would take a drink in the minute when the shaking had subsided a bit. Just scared, you know, life, all of it. And then because he had been in the military and seen and done, done those things and had lived long enough to know, he did not ask more. He nodded. And we sat staring into the fire, and I thought that any sane man who was in his forties and a good career, going, would quit now, would leave the dogs, end it now, and go back to the world and sanity, and I knew what scared me wasn't the canyon, and it wasn't the hook hanging by one prong, but the knowledge, the absolute fundamental knowledge, that I could not stop, would not stop, would never be able to stop running dogs of my own free will.